Welcome back, friends. In today's video, I'm going to introduce you to a new pattern that you can use to avoid excessive repetition of validation in your applications. It's really just a sequence of things that you probably already do in different places in your apps, but it's an enforcement of their sequence and making sure you do them in the right order and in the right places. So let's get started. In my last video, I talked about this concept of parse don't validate. And there's an article here on DevIQ where you can learn more. And also I have a link down here at the bottom to the original article, which I talked about last video from Alexis King with the same title. So if you have a chance, you wanna learn more about parse don't validate, I encourage you to watch my previous video, check out these resources and, and see what they have to say about this. We're gonna basically build on that principle in today's video. So the pattern that I want you to follow and remember is validate, parse, guard. Do it in that order as a sequence of three things. So as user input enters your application, the first thing you should do is validate it. Once you have validated it and it's passed, it's valid, now you're ready to parse it into a more restrictive type. Right, so if they were giving you an integer value and you were gonna use that for a temperature or an age or a quantity in the shopping cart, now you can restrict that to some other type that has a meaningful set of values that are not negative 8 billion to positive 8 billion or whatever the range of your particular integer's byte size might be. Right, now once you've parsed it, that's where guard clauses are going to make sense. So a guard clause, I've done other videos on those, is just a Boolean check to see whether or not something is in the range that you expect. And if it's not, it throws an exception, right? So guards generally will throw exceptions, whereas validation typically does not. Validation typically just is an expected possible return value that is generated in order to help the user produce valid inputs. So it's important for you to remember that the audience for validation is the user the audience for exceptions and guard clauses is going to be the developer. When you're treating these things in your application, you wanna think of them in that way. You wanna consider the audience, right? Anytime you're doing communication, it's always important to consider who the audience is for that communication. And so when you're writing validation messages, the audience is the user. You should be tailoring those messages for the user of your system. You may need to localize them or translate them for different users in different locales. All of that stuff is very much appropriate to the user and the user experience. However, when you're throwing exceptions and you're using guard clauses to basically stop the execution of the program and say, hey, we got into an invalid state that should never happen, right? Your audience there is the developer, possibly the ops team that might be seeing the log files, but they're just going to pass that on to the developer who then needs to fix the issue. So at that point, you're trying to give the information that a developer needs in a format that is convenient for them while also being efficient in terms of how you are going to log that information. So two very different audiences. All right, so before we get into the code and I show you this pattern in action, I wanna mention that we do still have a short time left when you can get the Nimble Pros Academy ASP.NET Identity in Action course for a really steep discount. So this course basically covers everything you need to know about ASP.NET Core Identity and using it with users. So this has some samples with Razor applications and it has a code along that shows how to use SSO with OAuth using GitHub with the eShop on web reference application that you've maybe heard of because Microsoft has had that available for, I don't know, 10 years now. You can see if you go in the Nimble Pros Academy, if you do it by the deadline, there is an early access coupon. That's literally the name of the coupon. You can see it on your screen and that will give you a 60% discount. So instead of $99, it'll be about $40. Uh, you can see it right here on the screen. So that discount is only going to apply for another week and a half or so. And there's a limited number of those available still, but we still have, I think, a few dozen at least. So check that out if you're interested. Get that course, get that discount. So the example I'm gonna show is for this particular pattern is using the sample application that is part of my clean architecture template available on GitHub at the URL on your screen. So in the sample, we have a real simple domain. We have this idea of projects that have to-do items. We have contributors that can contribute to those items. And it basically just tracks the progress of various projects. So this is using 
fast endpoints as a way to manage endpoints. Uh, it's using minimal APIs underneath that. And what it does is it makes it really easy for you to see the individual endpoints that the system exposes uh, without having to go and navigate through a 10,000 line controller. So if we look at projects, for instance, there's a create endpoint. And inside of the create endpoint, what you can see is there's a handle async method that does the work when somebody hits that endpoint. All that's going to do is create a project command and send it off to Mediator so that we can go through our pipeline of behaviors that we want to apply to all of the commands in our system. Then assuming it's a success, we'll return a new create project response. Otherwise we'll send whatever response came back from the resulting type that, that was returned. All right, this var is actually in our Dallas.result of T, which is a wrapper that will allow me to get back the success value if it was successful, but also things like forbidden or invalid or not found uh, in the case where it wasn't successful. Now, all of these mediator handlers are located inside of another project called use cases. And so the create command for create project is in there as well as its handler. And so in this handler, you can see that we're going to create a new project and we're just using a repository for this purpose. Now, inside of here, all that's happening is the data access. There's nothing too exciting, but you'll notice that I haven't mentioned anything yet about validation or guard clauses or, or any of that. So let's take a moment and see where that's happening because these are examples of cross-cutting concerns that you don't want to have polluting all of your code, right? So if you look at this code, it's pretty darn simple. It's just creating the project. That's the task at hand, right? And likewise, in the endpoint, all it's doing is constructing a command and sending it and then dealing with the result in an HTTP appropriate way. Nothing to do with validation, nothing to do with a lot of excessive guard clauses and clutter, all right? So where's the validation happening? Well, inside of fast endpoints, there's support for these validators. And so this validator is what's going to operate on the DTO that is sent along as the request, and it will make sure that the name is required if its length is not at least two, for example. All right, and we can see that in action. If we run the application, we go to its HTTP file, and we go find the create project here, and we say we're gonna create a project with just one character name, send the request, and we get a 400 bad request that tells us that the name must be longer than that, but if it's a little bit longer, then everything works just fine. Okay, so now that we've created the project, let's go ahead and update it. We can send this request as well, and you can see that worked just fine. Now, if we look at the update endpoint, you can see it's very similar. It just has a result that comes back, and it also has a request validator stating that the ID must be a positive integer, and the same rules for the namespace, or the same rules for the name, uh, in this case, just saying it can't be whitespace. Now, if we look at the update command, what you'll notice is that it is not taking in an integer and a string. It's using Vogen to generate those value object types. Vogen stands for value object generator. And inside of these types, if we go to their implementation, you can see that inside of the actual value object definition, we're adding some guard clauses here that perform this validation check. And so these, these are using the words validation, but they're actually guard clauses because they do in fact throw exceptions when the type does not follow these rules. And so when we follow the validate, parse, guard sequence, what we see that we're doing is inside of the update endpoint, when we go to create these types, this call right here to say project ID from request.id, that's parsing the type that we get in, which is just a primitive int, into a less primitive value object that has guard clauses around it. Same thing with this one here, we're parsing a string into a project name that has some guard clauses built into it so that it's going to not have invalid data. All right, so then the key takeaways that I want you to have here is at the very front of the application, in this case, the endpoints, that's where your validation should be happening, right? If you're building an application that's you know running as a Windows app, Right. When the user is interacting with the UI layer and XAML or whatever you're building, Windows Forms, whatever it might be, right on the click event, that's where you're gonna be checking validation, right? Or, or in the UI layer there, validate. But then if you've got a separate project, separate library where you're doing your business rules, maybe you've got you know some domain-driven design entities that are in play, right? those aren't gonna be doing validation. They're going to hopefully be using value objects like the ones I showed you, uh, or they're gonna be doing 
guard clauses themselves to ensure that they remain in a valid state, right? You want to ensure that your software design does not represent invalid states, right? If you have, you know, the use of strong types, you can make it so that your system can't represent invalid states, which means you don't have to validate for those states, right? It's t completely unnecessary. So use the type system for what it's intended for, restrict the ranges of things that various uh, values and inputs and whatnot can possibly have, and do that as soon as possible after user input enters your system. So once we get past this validation that's done by fast endpoints, we don't even see it inside of the create endpoint, right? This just happens, you know, before this even gets called, that's when that validation happens. When I get to this line, that validation has already occurred. So it's, it's kind of, you know, magic that's happening inside the pipeline that fast endpoints is providing for me. Once I'm inside of my application, right? And this is a clean architecture template, but you know, you can use vertical slices, you can use whatever architecture you want. Once I'm inside, I've got use cases, right? These are using my, my more rigorous types, my value objects. When I get all the way up into my core, my domain model, right? Now I've got a project aggregate and it has, you know, all the things that describe the project. You know, everything in here should be using those better types, right? So the name is, is of type project name. The ID is of type project ID. So it's not just an int or a GUID. All of these items are similarly restricted. And so I do have the occasional guard clause in here because you know it should never be the case that you would call add item and try and pass in a null item. And I don't just necessarily want to trust compiler warnings of C-sharp nullable reference type. So I'm going to guard against it here just to be extra safe. But the system should never under normal circumstances hit that. If, if anything hits that, that's a bug. And so again, the audience for that guard clause is the developer, not the end user because it's gonna tell the developer that they screwed up somewhere, somehow they had some code that allowed this uh, to occur when it should never happen, All right? And so this is the last stage, is these types of guard clauses. Validate first, then parse into better types, and then guard inside those types and inside your domain model against invalid inputs so that your system is always in a valid state, at least at the domain model and use case level. All right, that's it for today's video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, please hit the like button and subscribe. That'll help me reach more developers that could learn some of these tactics and tools. And with that, keep improving.